In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Thank you, Lord, for gathering us uh, together today. Thank you for the means and the opportunity and the technology that we are able to meet, even though we're in very various different places that are very distant from each other. Thank you, Lord, for your word and the many, many um, messages that you have left for us to read and dig deep in and dig our roots in it and to recall and to remember and to be comforted and nourished. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us to this most glorious time of the year, the Holy of the Holies of the year, uh, starting tomorrow and the Holy Week to come. Help us, Lord, to have the motivation and the love and the intelligence to disconnect and to unplug from the world and everything in it and from all distractions and to uh, try as much as our life schedules permit us, Lord, to plug into you and to focus on you and no one but you. Um, help us, Lord, to finish this great fast uh, with a great finish. Be with us, O Lord, tonight. Come and, and talk to each one of us in the in the way and, and with the words that he or she needs to hear today. <clears throat> Help us, O Lord, to not just be hearers, but also doers of your word and to apply it in our life. We ask her to please hear us through the intercession of St. Mary and all you saints about us who please you from the beginning, the mighty power of your love giving cross. Please, O Lord, make us ready to pray thankfully. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us the, our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> All righty. Um, <clears throat> it's good to have you all with us. <clears throat> Let's uh, jump in real quick because we have a ton of stuff to cover if we're going to try to finish chapter 37 today. I'm not sure if we'll be able to or not, um, but we can definitely try. Let's do, as usual, a quick review of some of the main points we talked about last week. And by all means, please uh, jump in if you have any additions or questions or comments or anything. Um, uh, last time, uh, we covered basically from um, chapter, what was it, 36 or 30? Yeah, 36 verse 8 through uh, 37, 7. Um, so we talked about a bunch of different stuff. First of all, we said we noticed how when Eve allowed the back and forth, the conversation with the temptation from the devil, the rest is history. She fell and uh, we all know the story. When Joseph the righteous was on the contrast, the example that when he, when he was confronted with temptation of the devil through Potiphar's wife, he ran immediately. No conversation, no temptation, or else we're toast. <clears throat> um, we need to remember that sin has cast down many wounded, and all those who were slain by her were strong people. Um, the best thing we can do is to run away from it. Um, then we said how sometimes the enemy fools us into doing things that we know we shouldn't do by twisting things to make, to, to make us think that we are doing a good godly thing or to appease our conscience. Although at the end of the day, as St. James said in, in James 1.14, each one is tempted when he or she is drawn away by their own desires and enticed. Um, all Satan does is just present temptations in front of us. Um, for example, I don't know, maybe you wake up in the morning and you're not tempted to go rob a bank because that's not a, a temptation or a desire in your heart. But there are other sins that when presented with the opportunity, we take it, you know, uh, hook, bait, and sinkers, they say. And so, and, and it, so it, it has to do, we fall because of the desires in my own heart. This is very important for us to begin with this, so that, because if we keep blaming it on the devil made me do it, or the world is so hard, or whatever, or our peers, then there's no fixing anything. So we've got to start by saying where, where it came from. And then we talked about how often the enemy tries to convince us in his twisted ways that God is the source and the cause of our calamities. I can't tell you how many times I heard people say, why is God doing this? You know, and, and, and 
because the enemy's purpose is to get us to a point where we curse God and die, like like uh, Joe's wife told him. You see, yeah, one of the many benefits of reading the Bible and going deeper in it and remembering it is because, like we said, the enemy keeps working. He keeps doing the same stuff, only packaged in different ways. So when we are familiar with the past uh, history and stuff that we read in the Bible, we're better able to, or better ready, more prepared to better fight him. <clears throat> so um, he says things like, God did this, God made it happen, God is mad at you, God is so and so. So while the matter of the fact is that God is the balsam, God is the treatment, he's the comfort and the solution of our calamities. He's definitely not the cause, definitely not the cause. Um, and then we talked about how, which is something that I think everybody knows, but not everybody applies, is that we can resist and fight the enemy with God's word. Um, so we need to remind ourselves that God created you and was incarnate for you to comfort you when you are faint-hearted, to open your eyes when you are blind, and to set you free. God is all about you. <laughs> um, let that sink in a little bit. We're going to talk about some that some more tonight if, if we get there. Um, one of the messages that uh, we read from the chapter for, was from verse 16. Now it says basically the message is, Forget the church, forget your Jerusalem, your place of refuge. Get busy with working and eating and drinking, and I'll give you more of that stuff, uh, more of what you have. And this sounds familiar because it's the lies of the devil that, that keep repeating over and over and over throughout history. Um, and then we said how the devil works through two main methods. One is temptation or attraction, and the other one is like threatening, terrorizing, scaring, uh, scare tactics. Sometimes using both of them and, and combining them like kind of in tandem to kind of like two huge millstones to kind of grind you in between the two of them from all sides, attacks from the right and attacks from the left. Um, but King Hezekiah did something very smart, uh, which is the first step in resisting the enemy, which is in verse 21. It says that... Uh, they they he they held their peace and didn't answer him a word that Abshakeh, the, the commander that King Sennacherib sent. And it's that we don't engage in conversation in thought with the enemy, or you will not win. Just run to God. And that brings us to verse 37. Um, and we saw how God sometimes allows the storm to come to give him a chance to prove his love to us to strengthen our faith in him, especially when we do not believe his word face value. And this is kind of what one of the many God accomplished from this, as you'll see at the end of the chapter, is that God allowed this to come uh, uh, because King Hezekiah's faith was not quite where it needed to be. Um, and we said, well, whenever you are in a calamity or a disaster or misfortune of any kind, do what King Hezekiah did in verse 1, chapter 37, which is go into the house of the Lord for it. Uh, if, if you do that, you're on the right track, and it's downhill from there. And then we, we came to a conclusion that when you walk with God and the people around you ignore you, ridicule you, make fun of you, don't listen to you, don't grieve and don't despair. The day will come, for sure. The day will come when God will bring or will allow a storm in their life so that they, to try to wake them up, and they will come to you for guidance and for prayers, the person whom they were making fun of earlier. <clears throat> um, then in uh, verse 4, it talked about the report of the living God, that he declared or clarified that the attack... And the insult was against God himself. It wasn't a king Hezekiah, against Hezekiah or the people. That Sennacherib or his Rabshakeh were insulting God himself. Uh, to kind of pin Sennacherib and his Rabshakeh, so hard to say that word, against God himself and to like arouse the zeal of God for his name and to just kind of step out of the picture. And this is another great lesson for us is that whenever possible while praying, <clears throat> Declare or clarify 
that the attack is really against God and directed towards God and God's children. Bring God into the formula. Bring God into the battle with you. Remind God, if you will, quote unquote, remind God that you are his child and that the enemy is attacking his child. Needless to say, make sure that you are indeed behaving as his child and living your life as his child would. Um, we said, like, we saw how God is already working before you even think or ask of him. Um, so do not be afraid, as verse 6 said. And then we said, once we pray a sincere prayer for God to help, or we ask God, uh, a godly person, to pray a sincere prayer for God to help on our behalf, we ought to fear no more, as verse 6 said, to fear no more, because it's now in God's hands. Regardless of what the outcome is, it's now his. He'll deal with it. God's in charge now. It's in his hands. And then we saw how God already told us preemptively in advance what he will do to our enemy. We know the end of the story. You know, we say like, you know, we don't know the future. We don't know the future. Yeah, we don't know maybe the immediate future, but we know the end of the whole story, capital S, you know, if you will. Um, so if we just hang in there and cling to God, and if we keep walking with God, and, and, and we know the end, the glorious end of the story, and God put it in writing too in the Bible. And then the last point we talked about was that God's promises are real and everlasting from generation to generation. We are not just reading history here. Pay attention to this. We're not just reading history. We are also reading present and we are also reading future. Do call on God's promises and tell him, Lord, you promised just like a little child with his father. But remember, in order to claim God's promises, we need to make sure that we are doing our part by obeying and, obeying and fulfilling the premises that came with the promises. Um, and that's pretty much what we covered last week in a very brief, quick nutshell. Um, does anybody have any questions or comments or additions or anything before we resume? All right, let's get to the fun part. <clears throat> really, the whole thing is fun for me. But okay, so we'll need someone to read from, uh, we're in chapter 37 of Isaiah, and we're going to need to read from verse 8 through 13. Six verses. Can I read? <laughs> Please go ahead. Surely. I Andrew, before you resume reading, you'll need to. Uh, I don't know, do the speaker or because there's feedback. Go ahead, try it again. Early upon, I will send a spirit upon him. Early, I will send a spirit upon him, and he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land. And I will cause him to fall by the sword of his land. Then the Rabshakeh returned and found the king of Assyria warring against Libna. For he heard that, had deport, that he had departed from Lachish. I'm sorry for my bad pronunciation. And the king heard covering concern, and the king heard concerning Terhakas. Of Ethi King of Ethiopia, he has come to you. He has come out to make a war with you. So when he heard it, he sent messengers to Hezekiah, saying, Thus you shall speak to Hezekiah, King of Judah. Do not trust, do not let your God and whom let you trust deceive you. Saying, Jerusalem shall not be given into the hands of the king of Assyria. Look, you have heard the kings of Ass that what the kings of Assyria have done to all the lands by utterly destroying them, and you shall be delivered. Have the gods of the nations delivered those whom my fathers have departed? Gozan, Haran, and Nerebsif. Um, 
and the people of Eden who were in Telsalar, Telesar. Where is the king of Hamath, the king of Ephraim, and the king of the city of Seph Arvim, Hena of Eva? Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry, your luck you ended up with a passage that's full of all kinds of crazy names. Glory to the Holy Trinity, our God. Amen. You did great. So, verse. Um, Eight and nine. It says, Then the Rabshakeh returned and found the king of Assyria warring against Libna, for he heard that he had departed from Lachish. And the king heard concerning Terhaka, the king of Ethiopia. He has come out to make war with you. Do you remember what verse seven said from last week? Well, Andrew read it for us, actually, but I changed the screen. Don't be looking at your Bible. Is it when uh, when God <clears throat> told him, Isaiah told him that God said to him that uh, there will be a rumor and that some people are going to fight him exactly. and he will leave and exactly. he will die in his place. Yes. Okay. Exactly. So verse seven, which said, surely I will send the spirit upon him and he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land. By the way, remember, Ethiopia was, was a force to reckon with, okay? Remember from several chapters ago, many chapters ago, it was the land of speed and power. Do you remember that? It was a very powerful nation. Um, okay, I have a question for you. Did God cause war with Libna and Ethiopia? Everybody's muted. <clears throat> no, Abuna, no. No. So what he, happened here? When he went home, when he found the people dead, he went his army, he went home and he wanted to pray to his idol, and then his children killed him, right? Okay, but this doesn't answer the question right now. We're not we're not recalling the story. The question mm -hmm. is: did God cause the war? with Libna and Ethiopia, and I see people shaking their head no, and if you think no, then what happened here? He allowed the people's will to, to come to fruition. Okay. Now we're talking. Um, allowed it, but he didn't cause it. Okay, very good. Excellent. So we're in agreement. If you don't agree with this, speak up now or forever hold your peace. Um, Correct. God does not cause or bring harm. God does not cause or bring harm. The enemy, the devil, out of his hatred for mankind, which is made in God's image and according to his likeness, all men, even unbelievers, right? Out of his hatred for mankind um, is the one who brings war and harm. God simply removes his hand of protection when it serves his people and their salvation. So the fact that those wars haven't happened yet was because God was sheltering it. God was keeping it. Okay. And then now God moves his hand of protection and sheltering. And now those wars come upon them. We, please listen to this. We have no idea how much God is sheltering us and sparing us from. We have no idea. I recall, um, was it last year? I don't remember when. I don't know if you remember this, but in Travis County alone, Austin, there's over, do you know how many 911 calls are made? Anybody? Yes, pick a number per day. More than 100,000. Over 3,000 calls a day are made to 911 in Travis County. Not hundreds, 3,000. Over 3,000 911 calls made a day in Austin. Let that sink in a little bit. So each day in which you do not have to call 911, thank God for his sheltering and his sparing you. Think about that a minute. 
really, I love that phrase that says, what this, but for the grace of God, go I. Or there, but for the grace of God, go I. <clears throat> if it weren't for God's grace, would be toast. God was simply sheltering and sparing the people of Assyria uh, from wars from Libna or Ethiopia. Um, but when he saw that Sennacherib and his Rabshakeh were what, what, were what they were about to do, he moved his sheltering hand, and that was enough to distract them and make them go back. Then look at the rest of verse 9. It says, so when he, when the Rabshakeh heard it, he sent messengers to Hezekiah saying, Allah, it's like big wars here and your king is like freaking out and it's kind of a panic and it's not just Libna, but it's Libna and Ethiopia. And you're busy sending messages to little old Jerusalem. As we said before, the enemy cannot touch you when you are walking with God, but he is relentless. And if he cannot touch you, he will at least remind you of what he can do to you if he touches you. He will threaten and scare and, and do whatever, you know, the smoke screens to distract you and to make you lose your peace. What, miss? So you just said that the enemy can't touch us when we're walking with God. But what about all the stories of like <clears throat> the monks who actually fight with the enemy and clearly and they are walking with God? I mean, it, at least that's the assumption. Mm hmm. So is that different from what you're saying? No, or? no. Um, first of all, it will not happen without God's permission. And it will not be for damage or for harm or for destruction. But as we saw with King Hezekiah, who was walking with God, God allowed uh, uh, the fear of it or whatever in order to strengthen our faith. But what I'm talking about is kind of like, I think I used that example before. Like imagine a little kid who gets bullied at school in elementary school, okay, or middle school, whatever, okay, now imagine this kid who is being bullied goes to school holding his father's hand and walks through the hallways of the school holding his father's hand, hypothetically speaking, what do you think that bully will do? He won't even dare look at him wrong, right, he may stand from a distance and like, so see, I got you. I watch you. I'm going to wait till you let go of your father's hand. And then I'm going to come and like, I'll devour you. It's scare tactics. Okay. So even though the Rabshaka has to run back to help his king and do his job, he's saying, you know, I'm still going to send them a message. <laughs> I'm still going to try to keep them in that state of fear so that they don't have peace. So he tells them, okay, okay. King Sennacherib, is, King Sennacherib is now distracted right now, and, and I have to go to support him right now. But, verse 10, do not let your God in whom you trust deceive you, saying Jerusalem shall not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. And then he goes on, and like he repeats the same stuff he said in the last passage that we read. He, he repeats the same stuff. Look at all the other nations who were destroyed, and their gods were not able to help them or deliver them, and... And he keeps saying the same stuff, verses 11 through 13. I'll just read them real quick. Look, you have heard how the, the kings of Assyria have done to all the lands, utterly destroying them. And shall you, and, and they destroyed them, and you shall be delivered? Shall you be delivered? Um, have the gods of the nations delivered those whom my fathers have destroyed? Gozan and Haran and Rezef and the people of Eden who were in Tel Asar. Like, just saying the same junk like he was saying earlier in the in the chapter and in, in chapter 36. Um, where is the king of Hamat? Where is the king of Arpad? The king of the city of Sevarvim? Hena and Ivan, like all the stuff. Look, we destroyed all these people. So we're going to do the same thing to you. Even though he's packing up right now and, and they're leaving the siege and heading away, we're going to do the same to you. Boy, this Rabshaka has kind of talkative, actually, when you think about it, right? He's still throwing threats. He's still trying to get him to lose his hope in God, even though he's about to leave him. Okay. Again, if we are walking, holding our father's hand, then the enemy cannot harm us. He can, whatever he's able to do is with God's permission and it's for our own benefit. So we should not lose our peace, even though it may be painful. Um. And this king is this Rabshak guy's like talking and talking and threatening and threatening. It's like, look, either throw a punch or walk away. 
don't just sit there and like bark at us. You know what I'm saying? And this brings a good point that I want to make here. This is especially for those who maybe tend to worry or be anxious a lot or think a lot, okay? Or feel responsible for a lot. Don't let the possibility of various bad scenarios that may or may not happen scare you and steal your peace. This is what the enemy uses. It may very well be the enemy trying to bark at you because he has not been given permission to come near you yet. Okay, just tell yourself, we will cross that bridge when we get there. And just keep walking with God. It may very likely be that it's just a smoke screen from the devil and nothing will happen. And he's just trying to get you to lose your peace now. I don't know if you recall, but I think we were studying Matthew and, 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 and we talked about anxiety. Do you remember when we said what anxiety and, and worrying is? We said anxiety is experiencing tomorrow's pain which may or may not happen today. It's experiencing tomorrow's pain today, even though that tomorrow's pain may or may not happen. And we concluded that anxiety is, do you remember that word? It begins with an S. Stupid. It, it doesn't make sense. Okay, halas. If I'm going to experience pain tomorrow, I'll wait till tomorrow. And when I'm going through that pain, fine. I'll be in pain then. Why experiencing the pain now? And extend my pain period, you know, of time, time period of pain. And notice that this time that Abshaka said the same message, but he changed the method a little bit. Did you catch that? How did he change the method this time? It was the same method message, but he changed the method of delivery of that message. <clears throat> The first time, huh? I think he was Yanni uh, threatening them that Yanni don't trust in your God. He was trying. No, that's to the message. That's the same message. I'm talking about the method of delivery. How did he deliver them this message the first time? The first one written, and this is Berber. The other way, exactly. You're right, but it's the other way. The first time he stood by the wall and he was shouting. In Hebrew, remember? Instead, and they told him, hey, hey, you can speak Aramaic. We know the language. You don't have to make everybody hear. And he was shouting all the more. This time, he put it in writing to make it a bit more official, a bit more scary. Okay? When we conquer, this is another point. When we conquer a temptation by the grace of God, remember that just like what the enemy did with our Lord on the Mount of Temptation, he will leave us. For a time, he will come back with new threats and new temptations or with the same threats and temptations only packaged in a slightly different way. One of the things that I've noticed from taking confessions that after people have been struggling against something and been doing great and after some time passes and they start thinking, oh, finally, I'm done with this. Yay. And they're really happy. Then he gets them. <laughs> And they go, Abuna, I don't know what happened. And I think what happened is that we let our guard down and we forget that he's roaming about. It's a continuous verb. He's roaming about, seeking whom he may devour. So don't let your guard down because we are at war. All right. Uh, does anybody have any questions or comments about this section? <clears throat> okay. Let's go on verse 14 through 20. And who'll read? Yalla, we don't have time. I can read. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. 14 through 20. And Hezekiah receives a letter from the hand of messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. Then Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, saying, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, the one who dwells between the cherubim, you are God, you are, you are alone of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. 
Open your eyes, O Lord, and see, and hear all the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to reproach the living God. Truly, Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste all the nations and their lands, and have cast their gods into the fire, for they were not gods, but the work of men's hand wood and stone, therefore they destroyed them. Now therefore, O Lord our God, save us from his hand, that all the kingdom of the earth may know that you are the Lord, you alone. Glory to the Holy Trinity, our God, for Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> um, there's a lovely word choice in verse 14 for the verb. Can you tell what it is? Spread. 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 What did you say, Missy? That's what I said. Spread. That before spread. Hmm. There's only one other verse. <laughs> you read it? Uh, he went, he went, went up. Went up. Oh, Fadwa yeah. got it. <clears throat> it said that Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord. It didn't say he went to the house of the Lord or he went into the house of the Lord, but went up. I remember a, a, a quote that is supposedly from Albert Einstein. I'm not 100% sure. Um, what matters is the quote. It says, you cannot solve a problem from the same level of the problem. You got to go above that problem in order to be able to solve it. So when you... When you face um, a scary problem and you go up to God with it in prayer or go up with it to his house or to the church, you're already setting yourself up for good results because you are elevating yourself above the same level of the problem. Don't think it about it at the same level, which is like earth level, world level. Uh, money, school, career, job, medicine, health, whatever, okay? People, these are all on the same level of the problem. We're going to elevate and go up to God. And then um, this reminds us of what King Hezekiah did in verse 1. I don't know if you remember that. In, in verse 1, in the same chapter, 37, after the the, the scribe and the, uh, I forgot their names, when they came in to report it, the King Hezekiah, remember when they held their tongue and and they didn't say a word to all the threats of uh, the Rabshakeh. And they went to King Hezekiah and told him. In verse 1 of chapter 37, it said, And so it was, when King Hezekiah heard it, that he tore his clothes, covered himself with sackcloth, and went into the house of the Lord. <coughs> this time it's went into. Did you see that? that but, but now in this verse 14, he went up to the house of the Lord. And that's a message. And now we begin to see one of the secrets of the success of King Hezekiah as a king who brought revival to his people, which is that when stuff happens, he goes up to the house of the Lord. He takes the problem to a level that's above. I like another verb choice in verse, four, in chapter, in verse 14, which you guys already mentioned, which is that he spread it before the Lord. He simply presented the letter, the problem before God. He said, here, you can read this. Here's what Sennacherib and his Rabshakeh are saying they will do to us, to your children. Okay. And he proceeded to pray. Um, and, and just the way he started his prayer in verse 16 is just lovely. O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, the one who dwells between the cherubim, you are God, you alone of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Does this sound familiar to you? Oh God, the great, the eternal, who formed men in incorruption, right? It's like yes. very similar to how we address God when we start our prayers or different litanies in the liturgies. Um, remember that the liturgies are simply prayers that people wrote. 
like St. Basil or St. Gregory or St. Mark, right? So it would be really beneficial. Don't think that this is the old way. This is how people prayed back then. No, it would be really beneficial for us to begin our prayers in the same manner. Don't dismiss this. This is very important to begin it in the same manner, glorifying and honoring God. It will help us better direct our prayers, if nothing else. And, and, and it should remind us and fill our heart of who God is and what he is capable of doing. And that we are his. Okay. If, if nothing else, regardless of what you say after that, if it's just simply recalling who God is and what he does and what he's capable of and where he is, that in of itself should, should help a lot. Notice how King Hezekiah addressed God as what? O Lord of hosts. We talked about that before. Meaning, O Lord, the Lord of the armies of angels. That's what hosts mean. Sabaoth. Okay. And we will see later that this is exactly how the Lord annihilated the Assyrian army. With one of those angels. Okay. And he continues on to present simply facts to to god <clears throat> um by the way I, I forgot to tell you this like here and in, 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 of course god doesn't have an ear or like you know eyes or or any of the stuff and he's saying incline your ear it's almost like a little child going to his dad to tell him something he say here come down bring bring your ear to me so i can speak directly into your ears you can hear me it's like summoning god's compassion and fatherhood and mercy and then he proceeds to tell him some facts in verse 18 and 19. Okay, he says, truly, Lord, the kings of Assyria have indeed laid waste to all the nations and their lands. And they did cast their gods, small g gods, into the fire. For they were not gods, but the works of men's hands, made out of wood and stone. Therefore, they destroyed them. Does this sound like a familiar method of prayer? And how often do we pray like this? Simply presenting facts to God. They have no wine. St. Mary at the wedding can of Galilee. The one whom you love is sick. Mary and Martha, sisters of Lazarus. Um, I want to encourage you to try to do that and to not tell God what to do if you can. Present the problem and let him decide what to do about it, if anything. Okay? We need to stop telling God what to do. Lord, life can be tough for those who do not succeed in school and get their degrees. Okay, does God not know this? Yeah, he knows this. Does God not know they have no one? He knows this. Does not know that? Does he not know that Lazarus or the one whom he loves is sick? Yeah, he knows this. But just present to him the fact. Okay? Lord, this person is the only breadwinner in this family, and, and they would be destitute with him or her gone. Um, just present the facts. <clears throat> when tempted by the devil with various thoughts of lust or judgment or self-pity or discontentment or comparison, these are all problems, right? These are all temptations. These are all threats. These are all scary things that should at least scare us. Just go up to God and present the facts to him. Present the thought to him and tell him, God, I am being tempted right now with this thought. Lord, I have this thought. Simply present to him the problem. Something that um, all of us ought to practice is that when we go to present something to God that we never walk away while still carrying it. We talked about that the last week as well, that we truly release it to him and leave it with him, surrender it to him. Do not leave the presence of God while still burdened. Do not leave the presence of God while still burdened. If you're still burdened, that means you didn't fully release it. Go back in to your inner room. If you're still carrying the burden, go back in and tell them, I will not let you go until you bless me, until you release that. It may or may not get solved, okay? Like, I mean, it will sooner or later one way or another, but 
if I'm still burdened, that means I didn't fully release it to God. That's our, our, our tell sign. Okay. And even though King Hezekiah did, <clears throat> um, yes, Mary, go ahead. <clears throat> um, when we have specific questions for God, uh, for decision making, let's say we, we personally just don't know what to do. Um, how do we know that the decision we're going to make is the right one when we want God to make the decision for us? It's a great question. Um, so I have an answer for this, but I want to hear from the group. Did everybody hear Mary's question? In summary, pretty much like how do we, when, you know, how do we know God's will when we're trying to make a decision? Anybody? I, I would say, Abuna, uh, there can be some like clues, uh, but uh, what I will say is that at the end, like for example, let's say that I want to know God want me like to join, for example, a student in medicine or engineering. Maybe I pray, I don't know which way I go. But I think the will of God at the end is our holiness. But at the practical life, I would say maybe it is very hard to like say definitively, like God want me to do this, or this is the will of God. But our belief is that at the end, God will direct us or correct us. But like to know um, first, uh, if I pray for something, it has to be according like to the uh, commandment of God. So I will not pray for something against God, like desire, and then I am um, saying that, oh, this is God's will. Very good. That one Thank thing. You. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Anyone else? Tabuna, from my, uh, my experience, um, the more resistance, um, the less likely. Um, it's from God. Um, and I'm not talking about challenging. I'm just saying about resistance. Uh, because sometimes I found myself, the door opened, I got in there, and it was an extreme challenge. And it didn't mean it was long term. It didn't mean looking back. It wasn't not God's will. It's just that was part of the deal. It was challenging. Um, but I'll say all that with a caveat that it's a lot easier to know when you have a, a pretty steady, long relationship with him. And you begin to know uh, what his ways are. And then, of course, I'm going to say you should always speak, whether to your father of confession or hopefully to someone who has also a close relationship to God to bounce it off of them. Thank you. Very good. Also, someone saying that when the decision brings you true peace or comfort. <clears throat> Anyone else? Um, pretty much like what you all said, okay? Um, first of all, uh, like I think Michael mentioned this, is that am I walking with God? It, it makes no sense to me when if I'm a person who lives life according to my own will and according to God's will, and then I want to make a decision, I want to know, then I want to know what God's will is. Okay, that's number one. Number two is when if anybody comes and tells me, Missy said dot, dot, dot. Okay, I will most likely immediately know if this sounds like something Missy would say or not because of the relationship we have. So when presented with something, I will be more likely, because I have a relationship with God or friendship with God, I'll be more likely able to discern, is this from God or not? Does this sound like something God would say or want or not? Does this sound kind of like what I read in his word or not? The other thing, which has to do uh, like with, with, and of course, like what Michael is saying, you know, checking with Father Confession or spiritual guide and so on. But the other thing, like Monir is saying, that at the end of the day, God's will for us is our salvation. That's what God wants for us, is our salvation. So there's a lot, that's how cool God is. There's a lot of things in life that God is 
totally happy to let us choose. Hopefully we will consider him. You know, if I'm faced with two jobs, for example, one job is, is pays more, but is in a city where the closest church is four hours away. And another job is not as great, but it's, there's a city nearby. Which one will I choose? It doesn't make sense for me to go, God, what is your will in this situation? Right? We know his will. It's our salvation. What will lead to my salvation is me being close to a church that I go to regularly. Um, and so on. Here's, Yanni, as far as, uh, like when you were saying, what major to pick or what city to live in or what, whatever. There's a lot of stuff that God is leaving that for us. As long as we consider him in the decision, we'll be okay. And here's the good news. If you are a person who is walking with God and trying to live according to God's will, even if you get it wrong, even if you mess up royally and you're totally blind to something that God wanted for you, it's okay, be at peace because he will, he will take your mess and correct it and twist it and turn it and redirect it for your own good. Do we see any examples of this in the Bible? Yes, Abuna. 300 examples. Now, Munir? I'm saying maybe about 1000 trillion examples. In <laughs> Many examples, yes. Uh, Mama, what are you going to say? About Joseph and what his brothers did to him. <clears throat> and God turned it to the best. Yani. Yeah, this is something that kind of was put upon Joseph or happened to Joseph as opposed to. A mistake that Joseph did, or maybe he was a bit arrogant or something, um, or Job. But the best example I can think of is Abraham, the father of faith, right? He 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 was walking with God. He he left his own kinsmen and 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 his town to the land that God will show him. And and he's like living on faith, you know, for so long. But then what does he do? He goes to Egypt and he gets a little bit scared, kind of like Hezekiah here. He took his eyes off of God, looked at his own limitations, his own resources, and he got scared. And he said, Sarah is my sister and made a mess out of things. Even though, you know, this is not God's will that I lie, okay? Um, but yeah, even, when, but even when he messed up, God took that and blessed things through him. And he left Egypt with riches and, and wealth and, and all kinds of stuff. Go ahead, Munir. Yeah, I have another example, which I love it, is like when St. Paul and St. Barnabas, there was a contention between them, which way should they should go, and if they have to take St. Mark with them or not. Mm -hmm. And actually what happened because of this contention is that Mark, St. Mark come to our country and preach it to us, so we are happy for this contention, not because it happened, but because also God directed for the uh, spread of the word and the yes, salvation. exactly. So remember that verse that we all have memorized, Romans 8, 28. God causes all things to work for the good of those who love him. And again, we said, love him means what? He said it. If you love me, keep my commandments. God can cause all things to work for the good of those who love him, even if they, out of weakness, out of blindness, out of humanity, made a mistake. He can cause all things to work for the good of those who love him. So we take rest on this. It's a great question. So even though King Hezekiah, we're going back to the Bible study now, unless if anybody has any uh, follow-up. Somebody said, um, you know, when you feel true comfort and peace, I would be cautious with that because the heart is deceitful above all things. Now, I will say maybe I will combine this with maybe what Michael said is that when I have true comfort and peace about it, and maybe when my father confession has true comfort and peace about it, or when I have true comfort and peace about it, and those who walk with God around me have true comfort and peace about it. But, you know, sometimes people can have comfort and peace about a decision that's definitely not in God's will. We, we, yeah, I said this a million times. Christians are not lone rangers. We are disciples. Everybody disciple of somebody, even the Pope himself. So going back to the Bible study, even though King Hezekiah did great and he spread it before God and he presented to the problem to God, he still couldn't help himself because of the situation. Like it's so tough. And of course, it's totally understandable, right? But he did ask the Lord to do something. He did tell God what to do in verse 20. He said, now, therefore, O Lord, our God, save us from his hand. 
which is okay. It's okay to ask, okay? Since he is our God, he is our father, he is our provider. If I don't ask him, whom will I ask? But look at, this is very important. Look at King Hezekiah's reason for asking this. It's very important, okay? He did tell God, God, please save us so we can, he didn't, sorry, he said that's a typo. I missed not. He did not tell God, God, please save us so we can live. God, save us from his hand so he can be ashamed. God, save us from his hand because uh, we have a lot of innocent children with us. Or God, save us from his hand so we can have a future. No. He said, God, save us from his hand. Why? Oh, Lord, God, save us from his hand that all kingdoms of the earth may know that you are the Lord, you alone. The whole motive of my prayer to you, O Lord, is so that your name may remain glorious, so that all kingdoms of the earth may know that you and you alone are the Lord. This reminds me, you know what this reminds me of? First Kings 18 with Elijah. Uh, do you remember this when Elijah rounded up the people and the 850 prophets of Baal and Asherah? And, you know, he put the, you know, the two sacrifices and so on. And, and like they made an altar and put a sacrifice and they said the one whose God is the real God will send fire from the heaven and will consume the sacrifice. And of course, they set up an altar. He told them, you all go first. You get first, first dibs. And, and they put the sacrifice on the altar and they were praying, you know, jumping up and down and hurting themselves from morning till evening. And of course, nothing happened. And then Elijah prayed. Uh, this is in 1 Kings 18.37. Okay. A very short prayer, very tiny prayer. And it was the time of the evening sacrifice. He said, hear me, O Lord, hear me. Why? That this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. That's why I'm praying. What percentage of your prayers are for the glory of God's name and for people to return to him or for people to know him and that he is the one true and only God? And what percentage of your prayers are about earthly things for you or for your loved ones? You think about that. You decide. What percentage of your prayers are requests and desires so that God's name is glorified and people come to him? So King Hezekiah prays genuinely. He prayed this genuinely. So that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you are the Lord, you alone. By the way, <sighs> this may sound a little bit cynical, but I'm speaking from personal experience here. Okay, we can pray words that make our prayer sound like they are indeed for the glory of God and so that people may know that he is indeed the one and only true God. But we may have alternative selfish or alternative earthly motives behind them. We, we can be excellent. We can be very proficient at fooling ourselves. So be careful. But we know beyond the shadow of a doubt that this prayer that King Hezekiah prayed was genuinely for God's glory. How do we know this? How do we know that his prayer was genuine for God's glory? It's from his heart, Yabuna. He didn't ask something for himself. Okay, how do we know it's from his heart? Because of God's response in the next passage. Yes, yeah. oh. <laughs> yes because of God's Thank response you. in the next passage. Um, so let's go ahead and read. Well, before we read the next passage, does anybody have any questions or comments or additions on this portion? <clears throat> nope. Okay. Now, the, the next passage is long. It's verse 21 through 35. 21 through 35. <laughs> I'll read it, Abuna. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Then Isaiah, the son of Amos, <coughs> sent, to Hezekiah, say, sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, because you have prayed to me against Sennacherib, king of Assyria, this is the word which the Lord has spoken concerning him. 
The virgin, the daughter of Zion, has despised you, laughed you to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem has shaken her head behind your back. Whom have you reproached and blasphemed? Against whom have you raised your voice and lifted up your eyes on high? Against the Holy One of Israel. By your servants, you have reproached the Lord and said, by the multitude of my chariots, I have come up to the height of the mountains, to the limits of Lebanon. I will cut down all its tall cedars and its choice cypress trees. I will enter its father's height to its fruitful forest. I have dug and drunk water and with the soles of my feet, I have dried up all the brooks of defense. Did you not hear long ago how I made it from ancient times, how I formed it? Now I have brought it to pass that you should be for crushing fortified cities into heaps of ruins. Therefore their inhabitants had little power. They were dismayed and confounded. They were as the grass of the field and the green herb, as the grass on the housetops, the, the grain blighted before it is grown. But I know your dwelling place, you're going out and you're coming in and your rage against me. Because your rage against me and your tumult have come up to my ears, Therefore, I will put my hook in your nose and my bridle in your lips, and I will turn you back by the way which you came. This shall be a sign to you. You shall eat this year such as grows of itself, and the second year what springs from the same. Also in the third year, sow and reap, plant vineyards and eat the fruits of them. And the remnant who, you have, es who have escaped of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem shall go a remnant, and those who escape from Mount Zion. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into the city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shield, nor build a siege mound against it. By the way that he came, by the same way shall he return, and he shall not come into the city, says the Lord. For I will defend the city to save it for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. Glory to the Holy Trinity, our God forever. Amen. Sounds like the Lord of the Rings. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I didn't want to break this part down because it was like just one message. Um, it's just lovely, lovely. Notice how God responded to King Hezekiah immediately. He sent orders and message and, 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 uh, uh, a message to Isaiah the prophet right away, okay? And so the Lord sent a message directed to King Hezekiah, right? Yes? No. No. It's right there. Yes, I'm with you. Yes. No. This message is not to King Hezekiah. Isaiah. No. Well, he did say it to Isaiah, didn't he? And Isaiah is the one who told Hezekiah? This message is to the King Sennacherib. It's yeah, to Isaiah, I'm... but it's to King Sennacherib. It's not to Hezekiah. It's like, Sennacherib. It's like Hezekiah just come a little bit to the side. I'm, I'm going to deal with this guy. You just Yeah, it's watch. a major rebuke. Yes. It's a major rebuke. Of... Awesome. Okay, so God does send this message to King Sennacherib. He said, you have made fun of God and his people and despised them. Well, guess what? Verse 22. He says, uh, the virgin, the daughter of Zion, has despised you, laughed you to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem has shaken her head behind you. Notice how it's past tense. It's like it's a done deal. Okay, he's saying, not the king of the Jews who will despise you and laugh, laugh at you. But just a little girl in Zion will laugh at you. That's how bad your state will be. Okay. God is giving Sennacherib a, a taste of his own medicine here. With these big words, okay, I'll play along. And it gets better or it gets worse if you are Sennacherib. Um, before we go on, there's a nice allegory that I came across here while preparing here, uh, um, which is that a virgin girl is not just a symbol of like maybe lack of physical strength or lack of like physical power, but it is also a symbol of beauty. And more important, it is a symbol of one who has not yet been married. Okay. And one... Uh, uh, 
It is as if God is telling Sennacherib that Zion will remain a virgin. You will not be able to penetrate Zion or overtake Sennacherib. Okay. Or as we know, the virgin also refers to what we know this from the last book we covered. Remember Matthew 25, the foolish and the wise virgins. <clears throat> yes. The human, soul. the human soul. Okay. The human soul of the believer, which is often referred to as a virgin, as we read in Matthew 25. So the real Sennacher, the devil, is always trying to take her for himself, to fornicate with her, to get her to be bound to him, bound with him, to live life of sin with him. But God is telling him, telling both Sennacherib and the real Sennacherib, telling Sennacherib and the devil, the human soul who is a believer and betrothed to me, because eventually will be his bride, right? For the great wedding. That human soul who is a virgin and is betrothed to me and wants to remain mine and keeps running and crying out to me, like King Hezekiah did, she will remain mine and you will not be able to overtake her. Okay, and can I ask something, to, Abuna, And she please? will be able, yes, just a second. And she will be able to laugh you to scorn and shake her head at you. Go ahead. And, and this uh, 22 verse, why is telling has in capital? What's written in capital? <clears throat> started in capital. Has despised you. Uh, so you must have meant I th I something. Think it's, I think it's just a typo. Because it's uh, a verb. It's not referring to anybody. I think that's just a typo. Um, God is telling Sennacherib, do you even know who you're messing with? Like, seriously? You have no idea? Who's, and, and you don't know who you're messing with or who's you're messing with? So he tells him this in verse 23. Okay, maybe you don't. Whom have you reproached and blasphemed? Against whom have you raised your voice and lifted up your eyes on high? And he answers him, his own question. Against the Holy One of Israel. You didn't ridicule King Hezekiah. You didn't ridicule the people of Judah. No, you did that to me directly. And reminds me of something, which is a lovely verse in Zechariah 2.8. Does any remember that? I want you to remember this, Zechariah 2.8. He who touches you, what's the rest? Touches the apple of his eye. He who touches you, touches the apple of his eye, of God's eye, the pupil of his eye. He cannot bear it. Or the same thing that, that, that God said to Saul of Tarsus on the way to Damascus. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Okay. Do you walk around and live life like someone who is that loved? Are you aware of this? Do you realize that you are that precious to God? Can you imagine touching somebody touching the pupil of your eye? How it like, oh no, he did it. Like that's like, you don't mess with this. And by the way, it does not have to do with your behaviors. It does not have to do with, with, with anything that you do. You just are that precious to him. A lot of us forget this. So we feel like we lose that because of our, Humanity and sin. Um, and he continues to Sennacherib, and you didn't even have the decency to insult me yourself directly, but you sent your servants to do it. That's how little regard you have for me. This verse 24. He says, by your servants, you have reproached the Lord. And he proceeds to talk about how highly King Sennacherib thought of himself and the rest of verse 24 and verse 25. And look how similar this sounds to Isaiah 14. Where have you fallen from, o Lucifer, son of the morning? Do you remember that part? So look at this, the rest of 24 and 25. And said, by the multitude of my chariots, I have come up to the height of the mountains, to the limits of Lebanon. I will cut down its tall cedars and its choice cypress trees. I will enter its farthest heights to its fruitful uh, forest. I have dug and drunk water, and with the soles of my feet, I have dried up all the brooks of the fence. He's saying, like, I'm so big that with the sole of my foot, I can dry up a brook or a river. I mean, like, so arrogant. 
okay? And now look at, look at this, like this is just lovely, how God is trying to reason with him to help him realize how small he is, the King, King Sennacherib, okay? And how limited he is and how ever existing God is and how unlimited God's power is. This is in verse 26. Did you not hear long ago how I made it from ancient times that I formed it? Now I have brought it to pass that you should be for crushing fortified cities into heaps of ruins. Does this sound familiar? God telling somebody how I did this and I formed that? Where or who? Sure. Job, exactly. Yes. yes. When God told him, did you give the zebra its stripes? Did you give it the, the eagle his wings? And, and so on. Um, but Job listened and thought about it and repented and humbled himself. And what did he say in Job 40, verse 4 and 5? He told, behold, I am vile and insignificant. What, what can I say in response to you? I put my hand on my mouth. I have spoken once and I will not reply or twice and I will, not, I will add nothing more. Okay. Having the virtue of listening and considering what's being said to you of being quick to listen and slow to speak can save my life eternally eternally and we're going to talk some more about that actually uh, this sunday god willing also in verse 26 god is telling sanetrib i have barred it to pass that you should be for crushing fortified cities into heaps of ruins He's reminding Sennacherib, I am the one who permitted this and who used you as a rod with which I can discipline the children or make an example of other nations so they can see that their gods are not the real gods because that's my only motive so that everybody gets saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Don't let all that stuff go to your head, Sennacherib. And because I allowed this to happen, to use you as a rod of discip to discipline them and the other nations that you attacked were not able to stand against you so that my children would learn the lesson. Verse 27, he says, therefore, their inhabitants had little power because I, I allowed this to happen. They were dismayed and confounded. They were as the grass of the field and the green herb. And look at this last part, as the grass on the housetops and grain blighted before it's grown. Does, does this part sound familiar? <clears throat> The last part of this verse, as the grass of the housetops and grain blighted before it's grown. I think uh, it was mentioned uh, in Sam Peter, sometimes like the glory of man is like the grass and his glory was fade away. That the was vapor. Also mentioned. Yeah. yeah, but, but I'm but, talking about something else. Oh. <coughs> Don't you know, Emily, you have to know exactly what's in my mind. <laughs> it's in the Agbeya. In the psalm, like yes. it says that uh, Psalm 1 is, and the evil is like the... The chaff which the wind scatters upon the face yeah, of the earth. Yeah. No, I'm talking no. about okay. grass on the housetops. It is in the Agbeya in the sunset prayer in the 11th hour. In, uh, in Psalm 128. Okay, it's the last one. The last psalm we pray in the 11th hours. Let all uh, those who yeah. hate... Kalash, the, the, Yes. Let all those who hate Zion be put to shame and turn back. Let them be as the grass on the house sups, which withers before it is plucked up, with which the reaper does not fill his hand, nor he who gathers up sheaves his bosom. These nations whom God allows Sennacherib to crush were the nations that were around his children and tormenting them. Right? And, and so like this prayer or request from the psalmist that says, let all who hate Zion be put to shame and turn back, let them be as the grass of the housetops. This is actually what God responded to or allowed to happen. <clears throat> and God said, um, we have 15 minutes left. Okay, don't worry. God said something similar to the king of Assyria earlier in Isaiah 10, 15. He said, Shall the axe boast itself against him who chops with it? Or shall the saw exalt itself against him who saws with it? Do you remember that? Isaiah 10, 15. We move on. Verse 28 and 29. He says, if you can try to picture like God speaking to Sennacherib 
and to Satan at the same time. Okay. Verse 28, 29. But I know your dwelling place. You're going out and you're coming in. You're, and your rage against me. Because your rage against me and your tumult have come up to my ears. He's saying, I know you. I know your type. I know how you think. I know everything about you. Okay. And now comes one of those scary therefores. Remember the therefores we used to read in the earlier chapters? Okay, verse 29, he says, Therefore, I will put my hook in your nose and my bridle in your lips, and I will turn you back by the way which you came. This part is especially like lovely and clever because this is actually what the Assyrians used to do with the captives. They would put a ring in their nose and put a rope through it and pull them by that rope. Because if you, if you can imagine, I mean, that hurts, right? Like you can't really resist or pull or slow down or whatever. You have to cooperate. So they would like really subdue like the people that they took captive and treat them like animals. So it's like God is telling him, I will give you a taste of your own medicine. I will, I will put a hook through your nose and I'll pull you back to where you came from. And now verse 30 onward, God's message is directed to King Hezekiah. Okay. So at first, I'm not going to uh -huh. go back, but he said, King Sennacherib, he said, tell him, tell King Sennacherib and tell him. But now he says, this shall be assigned to you. You is King Hezekiah. Okay. So don't get that confused. Go ahead, Michael. Okay, when he's speaking to the Assyrians through uh, directing it towards Sennacherib, right? Yes. Who, who's the who's listening to that? Is is a servant of the Assyrian there to hear this message from Isaiah? Actually, I don't know. That's a good question. Because the question I would have then is, it must have been a level of faith in 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 God from the Assyrians to accept the message right? Because they could just hear all this from Isaiah and say, like, what are you talking about? Like, your Lord does not exist. Your God does not exist. It's all nonsense. So there would have to be, which is even more indicting on the Assyrians, because it means that they actually do believe in him and his existence. Um, that's a good question. Um, so the message is to Sennacherib, because you have prayed to me, this is verse 21, because you have prayed to me against Sennacherib, king of Assyria. This is the word which the Lord has spoken concerning him. Okay, so this is to Sennacherib. God's message is to Sennacherib, but really it's to King Hezekiah and to the people. This is what I am telling King Sennacherib. Now, I don't know if they will write it and tell it, send it to him. I don't know, but, but also more importantly, pertaining to us, this is a message to our Sennacherib. You know, mm. Satan. Um, and he's definitely read it and heard it. And he hears us saying it right now. Um, it's a good, good catch. Good question. I didn't, I didn't think about that. Um, so now the talk or the message is shifting from what God now is sent to Sennacherib to now what God, what God is saying to King Hezekiah. He's saying, this shall be assigned to you, King Hezekiah, because he's talking to him. He says a you shall eat this year such as grows of itself, and the second year what springs from the same. Also in the third year sow and reap, plant vineyards, and eat the fruit of them. From the same, <clears throat> this, this part here in verse 2, he's saying as in from the same crop or the same harvest of the first year. Okay? He's saying like... Um, But that what you were from what you were able to plant in the first year, this will last you for the second year as well, since you weren't able to plant in the second year because of the siege that they did around you. And in the third year, you will be able to sow again, to go out of the walls and sow in the fields. Um, meaning like that Sennacherib's this this thing won't last. Okay. So you planted in year one and you harvested. Now, year two, you weren't able to plant because of the siege, but the harvest, I will make, I will bless it so that it still feeds you. And in the third year, you will be able to go out again and sow again and live life to the fullest again. Um, 
it's basically an indication of how quickly God will get rid of the Assyrian army. And you will have total, total freedom to sow and harvest and live a peaceful life. And as we said before, whenever you see in the Bible, you know, first, second, and third, right away we remember what? Resurrection. We remember the resurrection. A new life. And this is the promise that God gives to every soul that goes up to him and cries out to him and continues to cling to him. Verse 31 says, and the remnant, there's that phrase again, who have escaped of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. I love this. Roots go in which direction? Down. And what helps us go down? Is, the, is those tough moments that bring us to our knees, that help us to take deeper roots, just like it's the storms and the winds that help the trees bear deeper roots, okay? And we know that deeper roots mean stronger plant and, and farther able to tap into sources of nourishing water that's buried deep, okay? Those who grow downwards by digging deep roots will also grow upwards by bearing good fruit, Notice also a very important thing. Roots are hidden while fruits are seen and tasted by others. If you do not dig deeper with your roots, you will not be able to get enough nourishment to bear good fruit. You got to spend a lot of time and effort and energy between you and God one-on-one -on -one to dig your roots deeper into him. And by the way, and this happens with some trees, but if the roots were to grow above ground, meaning visible, what happens to those roots? It gets uprooted. <laughs> yeah. And, and they dry up and they're useless roots because they're, they're just sticking there in the air. They're like twigs. Likewise, if I try to grow more roots upwards in, and outwards, meaning in, in, in a visible manner so that others can see them, this will be useless dry roots, and I will not bear fruit. We all must be careful that we are not simply serving and serving and serving, and we do not take the time to go in our inner rooms, in our inner sanctuaries, and, and stamp, spend some one-on-one -on -one time with God in prayer and Bible and the church fathers to dig our roots deeper into God. A lot of people who have a servant heart can easily forget this important thing. It's very important. And the last part of verse 32 summarizes the whole thing. He says what? Well, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. God will not do this for the sake of King Hezekiah and, or, or for the sake of the people or even for the sake of Isaiah the prophet or for the sake of vengeance on the king of Assyria, but for the sake of his own zeal because God himself desires that all are saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. We can, by the way, we can use this fact to our advantage when we're praying. That's why it's very important that we pray using the word. We can ask God to save us from our sins, from our weaknesses, from our shortcomings, from our previous wounds, from our mistakes, not because we are good or because we deserve it or because we've hurt enough, but for the sake of his zeal, for the sake of his own desire, of our salvation, for our salvation. We say, Lord, have mercy on me and save me for the sake of your own zeal and for the sake of your own desire to save your children. Summon that, bank on that, like cash that in, if you will. And then the conclusion of God's message, verse 33 and 34, he, say, he says, therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria. Bottom line. He shall not come into the city, nor even shoot an arrow there, which he can do from outside. He won't even get to do that. He will not come in before it with a shield, nor build a siege around it. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return, and he shall not come into the city, says the Lord. Period. End of discussion. That settles it. And he ends it with a glorious verse. In verse 35, he says what? 
<clears throat> is basically something similar to what he said, verse 32, about his own zeal. He says, for I will defend the city to save it for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. This is a lovely testament to King David's, the repentant. And sure enough, when God gives his word, it's a done deal. And then I'll, I'll read for you the remaining couple of verses. He says, then the angel of the Lord went out, killed in the camp of the Assyrians, 185,000. And when the people arose early in the morning, there were the corpses, all dead, all dead. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went away, returned home and remained at Nineveh. Now it came to pass, as he was worshipping in the house of Nishrosh, Nisrosh, his god and his sons, that his sons Adramelech and Sharezer struck him down with the sword, and they escaped into the land of Ararat. Then Esar Hadon, his son, reigned in his place. So the Lord of hosts, the Lord of the armies of angels, sent one unnamed angel. One. He's not even one of the archangels, okay? And uh, annihilated the entire Assyrian army. And as we read before that he destroyed up to the neck, do you remember that part? But the head was left, okay? And the head is King Sennacherib. So he destroyed them all, but left King Sennacherib. And not only did King Sennacherib go back by the same way he came with his tail between his legs, but exactly as God said earlier in the chapter, he was destroyed in the midst of his own walls, in the midst of his own glory and safety, worshiping his own handmade idols, when his two sons killed him and betrayed, he was betrayed by his own children. Now, look at this too, that if he had died like with the army, this would have been a lot more honorable than dying in his own temple, in his own hometown, in Nineveh, in the capital, by his own children. It's like a, a lot of like disgrace, if you will. Um, and we kind of actually read uh, 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 an reiteration of this same event in another book in the Bible. Do you remember where? In the Old Testament? I think in Judge, there was also one of the kings. Okay. This. How about a Deuter canonical book? We read the same story in the book of Tobit. Um, that when Sennacherib became, now the king of Assyria, the one before Sennacherib, he was kind with the Jews. And if they dealt well and did good stuff, he treated them well. And Tobit was one of those people. And he was liked by the king and he gave him 10,000 uh, talents, or I don't remember how much, uh, 10,000 shekels, some big amount of, of money. Um, but when Sennacherib became king, he was uh, um, living at the same time uh, with Tobit. He was... Um, very angry with Tobit because Tobit would uh, bury the Jewish kinsmen in the land of captivity when they were slain, like in the streets, and he would take care of the poor and he would remind them of God's promises, his fellow believers, and he would strengthen them. And King Sennacherib took this as a personal challenge to him, and he promised to kill Tobit. And his family, Tobit, and his wife, Anna, and their son, Tobias, escaped with, with the clothes on their back, and within two months, the two sons of King Sennacherib killed him and Tobit returned back and became safe and sound again and resumed his service to the poor and to the dead and so on. I love stories like this in the Bible when we see God working from multiple angles and this and like hitting many birds with one stone, if you will, kind of like uh, Ezra and Nehemiah. These are like two different perspectives around like about similar events. And one can end this wonderful chapter with a question. Which work was greater? The fact that God was able to rid Jerusalem from her enemy and annihilated them? Or the fact that God was able to cleanse the heart of King Hezekiah from his imperfect, weak faith and the people of Israel? Which, was, which one was the greater accomplishment? 
I believe if we ask God, he would say that the latter one delighted his heart more. I can't, yes. God's measurements of things is, is not the world's measurements of things. It reminds me of when, uh, when Christ uh, healed the paralyzed man and asked the Pharisees, which is easier to mm. forgive or to heal. Yeah. Telling him to him or get up and walk, that's, that's no big deal. I can do this with my eyes closed, with my hands tied behind my back. But being able to tell him your sins are forgiven, this calls me very dearly. This calls my, my incarnation and my crucifixion and dying. Um, all right, we are done with chapter 37. Now, I want to hear if you have any questions, comments, and the usual. If anybody has anything that stood out or something that they're, they're going to try to remember or to... Uh, go by. We covered a lot. I have of a question, Abuna. Go ahead. Uh, about the remnants of Judah. Mm -hmm. This was written somewhere else. Was it in Isaiah or uh, or? Yes. I don't. I Isaiah is the book we read the phrase "the remnant of Israel" the most. Talking about like giving hope that even when you get taken captive, even when all this stuff happens, there will still be a remnant that will return. Thank you. Sure. I, I can't help but, you know, and I don't know if this is the right way of putting it, but how hands off God is. Um, it's almost like, you know, he, he's there. He's just waiting for us. I don't know if summon is the, is the correct term, but to seek him. But before then, it's just he allows. He, he's not he's not interested in um, being the puppet master and controlling every single thing. Exactly, exactly. He's the way of life. He's the way of death. Choose life. And by the way, for those who get confused when when they hear the phrase "prayers move God," this is exactly what Mike is talking about. God is ready, willing, and able to do more than we can even ask or imagine. He's just waiting for us to wake up and to go up to the house of the Lord and to ask him. Um, thank you. It's a good point. I'm reading the, uh, the comment here. Somebody says the new King James has, it seems the capital H seems uh, that it is intentional. Uh, there's the word which the Lord has spoken. Taib, let me look. I have a parallel Bible with five different ones. Let me take a look real quick. But I want to hear from the rest of you. If you have any um, more comments or something that stood out uh, for you or questions. I, I have a comment or a question, but I think it is related to what Michael said. But actually, I was wondering, like, Yes, did God like banish Sennacherib? Like because Hezekiah prayed to him or God was planning at some point because he said, because I saw your rage against me. So it's like at some point, God will banish uh, Sennacherib anyway. And, uh, but I think the great mistake that Sennacherib did is that he put himself against God. And the great like, thing that Hezekiah did is that he put himself behind God, so he protected mm -hmm. himself. So I was just wondering that God has his plan at some point. He will punish the evil one. But uh, did like Hezekiah prayer make this like earlier or so? But Anyway, at the end, is like what Michael said, is that God is waiting for us. And it's, it's actually our chance that we got protected with God because God will punish the evil one at some point. Yeah. Look at Seneca as Satan. So Satan put himself against God. So it's better to avoid being in this camp. So let's go the other way. Yeah, really. And, and it kind of to combine like what you said with what Michael said. And like, really, how smart is it that I realize, you know, like I, I hear sometimes pay, people pray and say, like, I rebuke you, like in the name of, you know, and like, 
we act as if we're like so powerful in, in like which is it's good but but even archangel michael didn't even say a day i rebuke you he said the lord rebuke you and and so i love what you said when you're about how like king hezekiah did something very smart where he went and hid behind god and he talked <laughs> You know, like he, he asked God to take care of the devil because we were not going to handle him. He's like an archangel. He's super powerful. It's good for us to, to be humble and to remember how weak we are, not so that we can be despairing or apathetic or lethargic, but so that we can call on God sincerely and ask him to take care of the fight so that he would fight. Also, can I say something, Abona? Mm -hmm. uh, this Sennacherib, also was treating uh, the Jews very fiercely and very like like a beast, yani, killing and hitting. Mm -hmm. uh, as soon as yani, God sent him to do this, but he was not kind like God just for discipline. No, he was very rude and he thought there is nobody above him and he was so proud of himself. Then when he came again, God was waiting for him, yani, but he did not correct himself. And when he came again to attack them also fiercely, he, he, saw, he saw the hand of God, what God did for him. Yes. Um, and as we see, like when we see what happened here with Sennacherib, when he said, I did this, I did that, I will this, I will that. We said this, we saw this in Isaiah 14 with Lucifer when he said, I will arise uh, above and go sit on the throne of God and I will do that. And we saw this with King Nebuchadnezzar where he said, look at the kingdom that I built for myself and all this stuff. As soon as they did that, they all of them got spanked. So remember to attribute things to the grace of God. Um one thing to address the point that was sent in the in the chat, um, there is in the Coptic Creator a lot of New King James, so maybe that's why. Um, but I looked at uh, the five ver different versions, New King James, Dua Reams, uh, NIV, NASB, and RSV, and the H is a, a lowercase h. So it's possible that this is an upper uh, a capital H in has, simply because whoever like made the app just copied and pasted the text in the in the database. Um, anyway, I, I didn't find anything that addressed that this was a capital H for any significant reason. So I, I do believe it's a typo. Um, okay, uh, anybody hey, else? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Abuna, I think real quick uh, to, to address what Munir was asking about whether it was really, was it God planning to do something or was it Hezekiah's, you know, prayer? Um, I think that that's the, that was the question, right, Munir? I mean, um, in the future, yes. Yes. when the Babylonians come and in, 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 in overtake, nobody, the, the kings were too proud to pray to the Lord. And it was brutal. And, and God allowed it. So... I think in this instance, if it wasn't for Hezekiah, uh, God would just have allowed it. Yes. All right. Um, thank you all so much. Um, as you know, this coming week is Holy Week. Many happy returns. And the week after is the week immediately following the feast where in which we just take a, a break. Um, so this means the next two Thursdays, there will not be a Bible study. And uh, our next Bible study, when are we? Will be May 6th, Thursday, May, uh, no, wait a minute, May 13th. Okay, the next Bible study will be May 13th. Uh, so the next two Thursdays are off, so remember that. And uh, I look forward to seeing you all at Pascha and uh, the Anshan of the Sick tomorrow. Um, it's right after Matins. The Matins at 2 p.m., followed by the Anshan of the Sick with the Holy Oil and then the Liturgy. Hope to see you all there. Um, let's go ahead and pray. 
In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Um, dear Heavenly Father God, your word is so packed. Uh, every verse, every other verse is like so full of uh, just a, a life message that a person can live by, just like the monk who took one verse to live by and, and was comforted and, and at peace. Father, please don't let us just be readers, but to be doers. Help us to remember things, and not just to remember, but to apply, to live by. Help us to go back and, and review stuff and, and to remember how to live a life just a little bit at a time. And at the very least, to remember that all we have to do is really cling to you and to live according to your will, and all else will be fine because we're holding your hands and you'll take care of everything. Help us, Lord, to be people who, when we pray, that we don't leave until we have completely surrendered it to you and we are worried about it no more. Bless everybody here today and help us to be really focused on you and you alone this coming week. We thank you for incarnating for us. We thank you for accepting all kinds of humiliation for our sake on our behalf instead of us. And we thank you for resurrecting in order to open the gates of paradise again for us, to take us with you back and to fix everything that we messed up. We ask you to please hear us through the intercession sent me and all you saints and martyrs. So please, from the beginning of the mighty power of your love given cross, please, O oh Lord, make us ready to pray thankfully. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us they our daily bread. Give us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now the love of God, the Father, grace is only begotten, Son, our Lord, God and Savior, Jesus Christ, the communion and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Be with you all. Go in peace. The peace of the Lord be with you.